welcome back to another deliciously evil episode of the Arcane Archive presents Meta Talks. That's right. We're coming back with another amazing installment of subclass discussions. We know you've been waiting. We know you've been missing it. It's been a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, a number of incredibly just interesting subclasses to discuss today. <laughs> yes. Sammy, would you like to go ahead and tell the audience uh, what are your two subclasses you want to talk about today? I don't, I don't know what this voice is. I'm not, I don't know if I'm here for it. It's kind of uh, like one of those old like assistants to like the evil like professors <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, I am doing uh, two classes. I'm doing the Hunter subclass for Ranger and the Way of Mercy for Monk. Uh, two kind of at the opposite ends of when these classes came out. Indeed. Um, one OG, one brand new. You know, But hey, both of them absolutely have their merits to them. So yeah. what you're going to tell us a little about later. Uh, as for moi, I uh, will be discussing... The intricacies of the Chronergy Wizard uh, as part of the Critical Role supplement, a Matt Mercer original, um, along with uh, another OG subclass from back in the day, although it was a little uh, debatable, I guess, whether or not you were initially supposed to be playing them, but it's going to be the Oathbreaker Paladin. Uh, quite the infamous subclass indeed for a multitude of reasons that once again, we will dive into uh, a little bit later. But with that being the case, uh, as always, audience, if you would be so kind to, you know, like and comment on the video, tell us, you know, a bit about your experiences with any of these subclasses or any of them, like ideas or thoughts that you have after we kind of talk a little bit about them with you. Um, be sure to also obviously uh, subscribe and share the channel if you haven't already. It helps us out immensely when we appreciate that. Uh, but without further ado, let's go ahead and dive back down into the archives. Sammy, would you like to take us away first with your first subclass? Yeah, we'll st we'll start with Hunter. I feel like it's it's only right to start with an OG class. Yeah, right. That's um, how it started. So with Hunter, um, it is the just the penultimate Hunter archetype. Um, it was the Rangers Ranger back when uh, the only other option was Beastmaster, which was terrible. Yeah, we all know. Um, we, all, we already talked about that. We all know exactly what that means. So basically, yeah. if you want to play a Ranger. You just played Hunter. Yeah, actually, a lot of people played Beastmaster, and it, it never went well for anyone. Nope. Um, but the reality was, it's like Hunter was the it, all of their stuff is about attacking. It, there's no like, and they're not bad. The it's it's, it's, like, it's not too shabby. Like they it was a have... hundred. It was a hundred percent about just fighting everything. Um, it was like a fighter, but with like cool ability like yeah, weird you, you, you had more nature s kind of abilities yeah. and like you know a little bit more skills here or there and you know you but could, you it could was use also, a bow it was also cool because it it allowed it was you had to pick certain things at every level so it wasn't like you could have two hunters at the table and they would work they completely could be different different yeah they could be potentially um different. but let's go over it so you don't get any bonus spells <laughs> no. i don't think you don't for for beastmaster either they should have i don't know why they haven't updated that no. or changed it but uh, now, with the additional ranger spells, you'll still get access to stuff. I mean, um, it's the same thing for sorcerers. Sorcerers did not used to get yeah. any additional spells for any of their subclasses, so, and still don't. So It's unfortunate, but it's just what it is. Um, but you get, at third level, when you take the subclass, Hunter's Prey. At third level, you get one of the following features of your choice, and there are three options to choose from. The first one is Colossus Slayer. Is your tenacity... Your tenacity can wear down the most potent foes. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, the creature takes an extra 1d8 damage if it's below its hit point maximum. You can deal this extra damage only once per turn. Giant Killer. When a large or larger creature within 5 feet of you hits or misses with you with an attack, you can use your reaction to attack that creature immediately after its attack, provided that you can see the creature. And Horde Breaker. Once on each of your turns when you make a weapon attack, you can make another attack with the same weapon against a different creature that is within 5 feet of the original target and within range of your weapon. So I, some would say you take Colossus Slayer. It's just kind of Colossus Slayer. Like it's, I, it is I just also, arguably the best of all. I also of them. Not really, really like, I also really like Horde Breaker. Horde Breaker um, in theory is a really cool one because it does allow you to, you know, 
hit more targets potentially, you know, so deal more damage, just have more opportunities to deal damage in one turn. But the issue with it, of course, is it's very specific restriction of the second target having to be within five feet of the original target, which is not often the case most no. of the time. So um, now there is, well, we'll, we'll bring up more of it later, but there is a reason that it exists and it, there is some stuff you can do to make it better. Um, at seventh level, you get defensive tactics. Uh, you gain one of the following features of your choice. Escape the horde. A top opportunity attacks against you are made with disadvantage. Multi-attack defense. When a creature attacks you with an attack, you gain a plus four bonus to AC against all subsequent attacks made by that creature for the rest of the That turn. shit is bonkers. Like, it is that really is, good. That is um, busted. Actually, all of these are really good. Um, and then steel will. You have advantage on saving throws against being frightened. Now, here's what mm. I will say. You can get escape the horde. Kind of, like you can get other things that'll help you not. That's take what I'm saying. Like place. you, like you don't. Uh, you pick up the horde isn't. Yeah. Just well, then, then, then as long as you attack, you'll, you they don't even yeah. get it. They don't even so, get the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. They're all good. Advantage against frightened is good because there are things in monsters I mean, that when you get frightened, you are useless. It's okay. But, hey. Like but by and far, you're not useless, even if you're frightened, you just have disadvantage on attacks and you can't move closer to the target. But yeah, you still but, can do stuff, but it's just like unless you're a melee character. Unless uh, you're my unless you're yeah. my very first character, the barbarian who got freighted by every dragon. Yeah, I mean well there, there, there's um, that and he didn't but... take Berserker, he took Zealot, so he didn't he wasn't immune yeah, to fear. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean that's you know that's why you have other creatures. You have a bard or wizard or paladins to help offset that, and then you don't have to worry about that anyway. So uh i mean again to be fair the other two they're not bad no they're not bad abilities i wouldn't necessarily know if they're i wouldn't call them good simply because like compared to the multi-attack defense the issue being is exactly that like you have a problem when you have multiple choices when one is just so blatantly better than the other two like th yeah. that there's almost there's no real justification yeah. or reason all, why you should just solid take it. But like, one of them is, is hands, like, hands up. Better. Well, for both of them. Like, Colossus Slayer, just on average, is going to be far more applicable to almost every situation that you're dealing with. Te technically, yes. Because instead of relying on fighting more than one target, you're relying on fighting... Or having a larger, larger creature, you know, yeah. with it, within five feet of you. And to be fair, you will fight a lot of larger creatures than you. This isn't, this isn't like... This would be plenty applicable. The issue being, though, is that it still uses up your reaction. Like... And it basically, you, you just attack. You just you just get an opportunity to do an opportunity attack, which yep. you could still technically have Colossus Slayer. And then if the creature moves away from you, you still have your opportunity attack even then to then use Colossus Slayer, technically yeah. speaking, because it would be a new turn. Yep. So it would, yep, yep, you know, yep. it, yeah. Same thing <laughs> with multi-attack defense. Like you just get a plus four bonus to any creature that attacks you more than once. Yeah, once once that first hit once that first attack goes through, it has to hit you with an attack. Yeah, that so is it's like main. so if it goes to attack you, it misses. The second attack does not get the plus four. No, uh, it's just but you still miss the first attack anyway. So it's like yeah. but like yeah, it's it's nice to, especially against some of the monsters in the later game. I mean, when attack. you get when you fight an ancient Two, dragon, three, that's got, four times a turn. Yeah, like when you have ancient dragons who can attack you three times and their damage is like buko ridiculous. Like yeah. you know yeah and you get this at level seven which is again yeah. kind of bonkers at this point you'll have a decent high ac most likely like yeah. because Every, you increased uh, your decks yeah you have decks. you'll be pretty good um but yeah they're they're skin i probably might not i don't know i don't know what i would do i don't know if i'd take multi-tech i don't want to get hit at all but that's me uh it depends I on mean, what type of range you're playing if but i mean playing, well, so you don't have to get hit but if you do get hit then it makes yeah. it even less likely you'll get I hit know. again so that's very true yeah um and then we have at 11th level multi-attack you gain Another one of the following features of your choice volley you can use your action to make a ranged attack against any number of creatures within a 10 foot within 10 feet of a point you can see with your weapons range you must have ammunition for each target as normal and you make a separate attack roll for each target now let me that's, again re i'm gonna repeat that that's pretty bonkers. any number of creatures within 10 feet that's that's pretty of a point you choose kind of crazy actually now <laughs> that's 10 feet in any direction yeah so it's ostensibly a 10 foot radius in all four cardinal yep. directions um that you can attack everyone now 
it is an action, which means you do not. This is not an attack action. This is just an action. You're using um, Bali specifically. So, so here's the deal. There are certain abilities and items and things that, like, they when you make an attack action, you get a bonus. This is not an attack action. This is your full it's a, action. It's a separate action. It's, it's an doing. ability. It's its um, own thing, again, called volley. Now, you do make a ranged attack. Yes, it still counts as a ranged attack for other things like Colossus Slayer. Yeah. Um, and then here's the melee alternative, whirlwind attack. You use your action to make a melee attack against any number of creatures within five feet of you with a separate attack roll for each target. Now, I've seen some people make some like melee build rangers with this in the right situation. It is kind you're of ridiculous. A, you're a literal blender. You could be a yeah. literal blender with, with the right of application. It is kind of insane. Of items and, yeah, situation. Now, right? now here's the deal. <laughs> Don't, though, and just take volley because you're still going to put out way more damage. Yeah. It's so many. There's so many so many better options there's they're always going to be more of them close together in a well it's radius. also yeah, i'm going to say within the 10 foot you know range is obviously just better than the five like because again whirlwind attack obviously in like video games always an amazing ability because you're often going to have just hordes of enemies coming at you and you can usually just move with the whirlwind to get closer to them and like you know stack it up again in D D you are not often going to be like ganged up on by multiple enemies. No. At, at most, normally, it'll probably be two enemies maybe at once. Unless, and they unless might try to like flank you. Or, you know, or unless, you know, you're maybe you're Sam and you rush headlong into fights. Oh, I 100% like, you know, I do all the time. And, yeah. And I mean, like, again, it's just a lot of the time you might not, because again, because there are multiple of your party members, a lot of the time the GM also doesn't want to specifically target Focus, any one yeah. character. So they usually spread out the damage and the, the enemies accordingly as well, which is one reason why some of these like abilities, such as like attacking a target within five feet of another target. It's like, that doesn't happen as often exa exactly because usually the GM wants to spread it out. And even if you do have multiple people on you again, they're probably just going to move to try and flank you. They're not going to necessarily yeah. be like right next yeah. to each other. And and what is also true is like Hordebreaker works like it, it, it's a weapon attack. It's not a melee weapon attack. Yep. You can use a ranged weapon, but if you're going to get volley later on, there's no reason to get Hordebreaker. No, it, it, it kind of literally just defeats the purpose of Hordebreaker almost when, entirely. In the reality with, with volley, you still can add that D8 onto somebody exactly with colossus it, it's Slayer. just or yeah with with the process you can only add it to one of those attacks but it's still a free d8 yeah um, that you can just target onto a specific enemy that you hit yeah, just just and you're just like pick yeah one i'm gonna hit him with damage. colossus slayer like and so it's like again whirlwind attack if you do get flanked you know it's nice but you can also still just technically if they're right next to you mm -hmm. you can still just volley above you and technically hit everybody within 10 feet around you. You'd be at disadvantage maybe for the attacks, but you could still just do that anyway. Like yeah. you and, and still potentially get like, it would be a disadvantage, but still. Um, no. So overall, yeah, you definitely just kind of want to take volley. And, and yeah. again, that is one of the, the, the back ends of, of kind of this subclass is that, it's it's kind of just a clear cut choice on a lot of the ones that you should take. Again, you can take the other ones. It's not like you can't take the other abilities because obviously, me and Sam, we we are we could be considered power gamers or a little bit more optimized and such because we like feeling powerful and we like being good at what we do because we find that fun. Um, but you know, for other people who are like maybe you have a very specific type of campaign, maybe you have a campaign that is more like, uh spooky scary and and like you're you're less overpowered or or like heroic in nature and so obviously having steel will then would be incredibly helpful because maybe a lot of things are trying to frighten you yeah in a lot of other dms or a lot of other campaigns there there isn't necessarily a shit ton of things that usually try to frighten you unless your gm deliberately makes it. like dragons can try to they're they're a big one um there are a fair amount know, of undead yeah i was gonna say certain things. undead absolutely try to um but other than that in in a sense there's not really a lot that uh deliberately try to frighten you in that way um 
But again, same thing, like, you know, an opportunity attack, same thing. Like if you're trying to like run away, if you don't have like, you know, I mean, I still think multi-attack defense would still do, do you best because technically speaking, you could, you know, even if, if you get hit once, you're just automatically going to have an instant. You have almost the equivalent of a shield instantly with, with no, with no resource expended, expended. Yeah, it is really good. Like, and again, um, at seventh level, like you will be fighting things that have multi-attack at that point. Um, but, you know, overall, like that is one of the drawbacks, but they're, the other options aren't bad by no. by any means. They're I just think probably the opportunity attacks one is the worst one. Yeah, the opportunity because there are many other ways to just not get opportunity attacks and and to either just make them not even a thing or also just have disadvantage anyway. And yeah, or just you have know, a longbow and shoot them from hundred feet. Yeah, or like giant killer isn't awesome either because it also is very specific about larger larger creature within five feet of you, and then you basically are just like oh I I just get the equivalent of doing a, a, a reaction in an opportunity attack which is like well yeah. you know it's it's yeah it's just not it just it just doesn't it it doesn't have enough bang for its buck like the other ones do it, it like the the application first they have very specific parameters that need to be met which aren't incredibly super rare but they are still things that are like they they cannot be applicable if you don't fight something that's bigger than you like that is considered large or larger even yeah. if they're taller than you, technically be, speaking, it's a size class. It's not... a size class, and that can be, you yeah. know, so so then you're like, well, against other humanoids, you essentially do not have another ability yeah. present. Class class of slayer is just going to be better. Um, yeah, it's just more applicable. Like that, and, and it, that's what we like. You know, and anything that used, is used, well. they can be used with either one of the multi attacks if you want. Exactly, to take and, one and over it the also other. synergizes with the rest, which is again an, another thing we always say when we have these subclass discussions. Any subclass or any ability in a subclass, you can you can see its true worth and its value and its ability if it is going to be applicable throughout the entirety of your time playing this character, yeah. right? If it's if there are certain st stuff or certain restrictions where it's like, I don't really see how, how I'm really going to use that. A lot of the time, a lot of newer players can fall prey to some of this because they, they don't understand exactly like how normal D&D campaigns or sessions go and what really to expect. Yeah. And like I said, the frightened thing, or even just like, you know, whatever else, it's like, yeah, you don't have a shit ton of creatures unless it's a very specific themed or styled campaign that will be constantly trying to frighten you. And so you you also just passed up other potentially great abilities that would be much more applicable for this specific one because you were like, this seems cool, and it never comes up. And so that that doesn't feel good. It's, it's never yeah. a great feeling. But... Um, again, there's the, the multi attack options. They're both they're both usable. Even they are. Warwind attack is usable. Like, yeah, um, for sure. Especially if you're if you're like like Sam, you get in the thick of things with yeah. melee. You know. But volley is just ridiculous. It's just better. It's just far more. Any applicable. number of creatures. Um, it just gives me the the idea of like you know if you're if your if your DM likes to do like grandiose like you know uh, RTX style like war campaigns. I was gonna say yeah. Of, like, there's things like that because you could you literal could hordes wall, of enemies yeah, yeah you could hop on a wall and kill and like hit like everyone in a 10 foot rate in like it's a 10 foot radius so 20 foot diameter yep. square basically or circle i guess it would be if you have a good bow like That's, if you have like a, a if you have an bow, oath bow like if you have an yeah. oath bow which like, you're doing extra damage and like you got extra shit going on yeah that's fucking insane. You get like some specialized arrows and things you, like that. You can wipe out whole squadrons by yourself. Like it would be, you could just, it would... you could just do it every turn. Now, to be fair, again, you would have to target. You can only hit each creature once individually. Like you, you like you, you give up your your focus fire multi attack, but in lieu of just being able to hit multitude of people, to hit you everyone. know. Yeah, and, and obviously, also, again, you do have to use ammunition still, but yeah. most D&D games... Yeah, yeah, Unless you're silly. using specialized ammunition. Yeah, which and again, a, bit a lot of the time, a lot of D&D campaigns also, to be fair, they don't necessarily keep track of ammunition like that because... Except for the special ones. Yeah, except for very special ammunition. Because again, it's like, if you're if you're a ranger and you're going for like an archer build like you're that... Yeah, you know how to make arrows. You should you should know how to make arrows on top of the fact that it's just, it's just easier. You know, it's just like, it's... In my opinion, and I think in a lot of people's opinion, bent, like 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 dumbing down on a lot of the more like small, more minute things and stuff, it just it just 
serves for a far smoother and cleaner game overall than having to constantly yeah. worry about like, oh, I have, you know, seven arrows left. And I I didn't say I was going to go pick them up because, you know, in, in actual rules, it's like, oh, yeah, if you fire ammunition into an enemy, you can then, you know, go and, and do like a check or whatever to, yeah. to recover. Depending on, the type of, depending on the type of enemy, depending yeah. on where your attacks went. Where your attacks went, you know, to you recover know. your ammunition. I think and it makes like, sense in certain games. Things like yeah. Tomb of Annihilation, Curse of Strahd, like games. Yeah, if, like, if it's much more like focused on survival and much more about yeah. like you, you got to be a little bit more intentional about that stuff for sure. But in, in games where you're not necessarily stopping off at towns or whatever very often, you're always on the move. It just becomes... It it becomes tedious and 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 bogs down the game unnecessarily in a multitude of ways. When other in, when other people have like, yeah, I've got magic swords and items that I don't have to like, you know, I don't have to clean of blood or I don't have to like sharpen and and keep up, you know, other things with equipment. Yeah, keep them from rusting and exactly or or you know or or dulling. Like it's like you know if I you have don't to keep the wooden general dry upkeep so they don't of, of equipment is just tedious and unnecessary yeah. in most games. Flavor wise, so. it's awesome. But yeah. the actual having needing to, write it to down like, and yeah. do it, all that shit is not fun. Um, finally, at 15th level, you get Superior Hunter's Defense. Now, this is going to be a fun one. You get to pick from three things you get evasion. We already know what evasion is. That's uh, when you have to make a dexterity saving throw from a spell or an effect, you only take half damage if you fail. And if you succeed, you take no damage. Uh, now, evasion should be familiar because you get it as a rogue. And a, and monk. As a monk. At uh, seventh this, level. This, this is the only way to get evasion as a full ranger. Yep. No other, there's no other way to get it except 15th level in this subclass. This is kind of a, a straight slap in the face because you know everybody, everybody and their mother even said arguably they should just get this. No, I like this. No, Ranger, Ranger, like Ranger should just get. Should. They, they get. They have the opportunity. Not even like it's not even guaranteed. It's just they have the opportunity with this subclass to get, Only. to to get an ability that both rogues and monks Personally, get literally half a level before at half the level. <laughs> Yeah, I personally I don't This is 15th I don't, level right here. Yeah. Personally, I don't think Rangers should get evasion. Um I mean they're, evasion, but they're all they're just as deck based and focused most of the time. Yeah, though. yeah, but they, and they're, they're also they're, a skill they're considered a skill class. They're not a skill class though. Well they don't they get are, a, they though. don't get that many proficiencies. They're not exactly I mean technically they do with their with their so-called, you know, uh you know, it used to be specifically. They they've switched it around now, which made it they've made them more skill based now for sure yeah, to a degree but even in the even in the original you know they still got the whole oh favorite terrain favorite enemy where you yeah, would literally I, get bonuses and which skills. almost none of that's actually applicable anymore but that was still the intention yeah. though like that their intention was to make them similar to like uh rogues and bards that they would be more skill monkey-esque but yeah. they just the way they set it up was severely lacking where yeah. which is again why it's like they should arguably I, have evasion the same time that rogues and monks do. Yeah, I don't. I mean, eh, I, I think we have enough people with with evasion. Personally. Do we? It's but, only two classes. Yeah, it's also a really, really good ability. Yeah, yeah. it's very strong. And yeah. I think of any class, rangers probably deserve to have it, Sam. Well, <laughs> of any class. Play more hunters, I guess. Wait, play a level 15. Yeah, all, I, all the way to 15 for sure. Yeah, yeah. let's do that. I mean, I don't know. I've had plenty of characters get that level, but I also play different yeah. kinds of games. Yeah, and yeah, you have a, you've you've been able to stick with us one, one of the same groups for over six years. So yeah, um, yeah, Mister Entitled over here. Uh -huh. Now here are the other options that you can take but shouldn't. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Stand against the tide. When a hostile creature misses you with a melee attack, you can use a reaction to force that creature to repeat the same attack against another creature other than itself of your choice. Now, here's here's an interesting thing. It says it does not give a specific range requirement. Yeah, but like you can't just make it attack something that it can't reach. I mean, that's not, that's kind of the thing where it's just this is yeah, like that's a that's a really. Poorly a, worded a, I mean, it's not because, it, it, like, technically speaking, just because it doesn't say that there is a that, it, we that make, there is it's a, a melee a weapon range, attack. yeah. Because, like, again, if the creature can't make a melee weapon attack, against, it just doesn't. It just can't. Like, it's like again, if it can't reach the dude, it can't make a melee weapon attack. So it's like, but this is only if it misses you, which is 
I mean, it's just a weird, it's a weird ability. I mean, and then you know, you technically, get... it, it, it would stack with the previous ability yeah. with with defense. Like funny. if he hits you the first time and he swings and you have a plus four to your AC, he misses. You could yeah. technically then use this to make him attack can. someone else, but um, or you can take uncanny dodge. Jesus. Now again, I'm okay with evasion being here. Why the fuck is uncanny dodge here at a level fifteen? Like that doesn't make sense. Uh, once They're again, not, those one can skills. arguably just say they should just get access to that at a lower level. One, like one of uh, one of these is not like the other. <laughs> at this point, you're a 15th level ranger trying to act like a seventh level rogue. Like what? Yeah, it's cool. What is this? Like I like this um, is what I'm like. Again, uncanny dodge is a great ability. It's it's quite powerful. You know, it, it literally allows you. To just have any attacks damage that's against you, as long as you can see it coming. Yeah, just the like, one, though. but still, it's your. I mean, it's reaction, but it's still essentially the same as like, basically getting like a. Uh, if, for instance, you have an, a a dude who hits you with the first attack, uncanny dodge is a reaction. Now you have a plus four bonus to your AC to make it even less likely that they'll hit you for the next ones. Like, so he didn't even do full damage against you for that first attack, and now you're bolstered up and ready to go. Like. This allows you just far more survivability. It evasion is, it is a bit of a combo. Yeah, evasion is nice because it's like if your deck saves. The issue being though, especially hey, take it from me as a person, I love monks, I love rogues, so I've had evasion quite often. You will not believe how often GMs deliberately try to attack you with abilities that are not dex based. Yeah, they will constantly try to be like, uh, make a con save, uh, a strength save. Uh, you know, they, they deliberately, because every because all GMs hate and loathe evasion with the burning passion of, of a thousand fiery suns, they will always make it their, like, their life's goal to never target the rogue or the monk with a dex-based saving throw. And it kind of sucks, because it's like, that's the point of the character and the ability, okay? Like, yeah. it, yes. I, you can deal damage to me, but let me do this thing to look cool and badass. What is cooler than, yeah, literally a wizard fires a fireball at you and you just do some like dope, crazy breakdance dodge move and you just come out of the smoke and fire just completely unharmed. Like, that's great. Along with the fact is, to be fair, in regards to me, I, I, I am a serial horrible roller. So I might still most likely fail to save and I'll still only take half damage though. So I still take damage. So it's like, but this, this at this level, at 15th level, like, don't get me wrong. Again, evasion is probably going to be super helpful because you're going to be fighting a lot of stuff that has like a lot of AOE attacks, a lot of yeah. AOE abilities. And they they hopefully will be decks for the most part. But uncanny dodge is also just something there. It's like, hey, once per turn, or what rather, sorry, once per round, you can just have any attacks damage and specifically attack, not just damage in general, but any attack roll made against you. If it hits you, you can just have that damage. Yeah, it is nice. Um, I will say evasion is just really good because as much as a DM is going to try to throw stuff at you that doesn't, that isn't dex based, a vast majority of a lot area, of shit is uh, a, a lot, lot of, of effect damage and high abilities. Damage. Yeah. Um, a lot of, Area of effect, high damage abilities are dex based, mm -hmm. um, and being able to just be like, <laughs> yes, yeah, like, is, is, um, is a great feeling. No, like just like yeah. just like uh, I've never thought of maybe not no. actually. Uh, mm. Like my my like I say rogue, no to that. No, yeah, my rogue fighter combo with the with having evasion and uncanny dodge and it, it's you just a lot of things you just don't take hits from. You don't take damage and. It's nice. It's nice. It, it feels you, good. It's also really fun because it turns you into like a mage's worst nightmare, um, which can be great. So that's just me. That's kind of my. I, I mean, like same. It, it's just it's just kind of a shame that they're getting this at fifteenth level, and you also you only get one. Like obviously, again, Santa gets the tide. Kind of bad. Pretty bad. Uh, but evasion on Candy Dodge. It's like again. It's like oh, I. I'm 15th level ranger and I can basically be like I'm I'm trying to be a 7th level or maybe only like a 5th level rogue like 
one of the choose one of the two. I'm 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 I am now only now getting access to being a seventh level or fifth level rogue. Technically, not even truly a seventh level rogue, because at seventh level, rogues again can do both of these things. So you will technically kind of just be a fifth level rogue. So it's like, hmm. I mean, to be fair, to be fair, you do get a number of other abilities that are very cool at this point. This, however, of course, being the capstone ability for this subclass is just a bit underwhelming. Um, yeah. Because they, it's, 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 like, it's like the writers or the creators like <laughs> lost ideas or inspiration of any kind of more uh, original or interesting ideas. And they're just like, oh, let's just take stuff from the rogue and give it to the ranger now. And it's like, yeah, but I see that's what I'm saying. See, my cat, he also agrees. He's like, yeah, that's pretty lame. Uh, I know, but I'm telling him, man, it is lame. It's it's pretty lame. Uh, but that being the case, you know, it's like it's it's still a it's still a good subclass. It is. It's it's still a cool, interesting subclass, even up to this point. Um, but definitely, you know, it's it's nothing flashy. It's nothing real, real, you know ostentatious or or whatever but it's it does what it does pretty well and what it does normally if you you know want to build it right is it, it deals damage is what it's supposed to do it is it is the the damage dealer ranger class you know uh that's that's what hunter's there for now you know there there is an argument that other later on ranger subclasses can arguably deal kind of more damage but this 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 subclass is still cool in a lot of ways again colossus slayer still awesome multi-attack defense is great you know uh volley is super cool like if you get the opportunity to use these abilities they are cool and they feel good to use when you get the opportunity to use them yeah they really they do a good job and they like, feel good it's just satisfying it feels satisfying it's kind of funny that it still works yeah as well as it can like well, it could you know, work this well um considering how much they've how much they've changed sim simplicity often is you know it it withstands the test of time because it's just simple and straightforward you know it it, it there there are certain aspects of of any thing of, of everything that's just like yo these are the foundational stuff and if a certain thing takes care of and handles and covers those foundational things it usually can last for a long time and, and still is applicable and effective. Uh, anything else can you want to talk about with the Hunter, bud? No, that's, that's all I got, I think. All right. Well, yes, buddy. Yes, yes, yes. I know. We're moving on. I know you wanted to talk about uh, this particular class as well. You were excited. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and move on uh, to the one I wanted to talk about today, the first one I was wanting to discuss. That is... The Wizard uh, Chronergy Magic subclass. This, again, being a Critical Role uh, edition, Matt Mercer original. Uh, these particular wizards focusing on the manipulation of time. Those who follow the Chronergy tradition learn to alter the pace of reality to their liking. Using the ramping of anticipatory dunamis energy, these mages can bend the flow of time as adroitly as a skilled musician plays an instrument, lending themselves and their allies an advantage in the blink of an eye. You can already see right there, Matt, Matt Mercer has always been a, a, a bit of a bard with words, um, as he has a particularly vast vocabulary. I always love and appreciate and respect that about him, because uh, I like to do such things as well. But... That being the case, when you get this sub or when you choose this subclass at level two, you get access uh, to two separate abilities. One being Chronal Shift. You can magically exert limited control over the flow of time around a creature. And as a reaction, after you or a creature you can see within 30 feet of you makes an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw, you can force the creature to re-roll. You make this decision after you see whether the roll succeeds or fails. That is a huge part. The target must use the results of the second roll. You can use this ability twice, and you regain any expended uses when you finish a long rest. So that right there is a huge thing. Uh, there are clear inspirations as well for this subclass from the Divination Wizard subclass as well. They're very similar in a lot of ways, or at least in terms of like how 
a number of their abilities kind of affect things or or are flavored. Um, the other ability you gain at level two is temporal awareness. You can now add your intelligence modifier to your initiative rolls. Now, again, that's pretty huge. Um, I think a lot of you might also be able to uh, kind of maybe hint, uh, see a little bit of a theme here. A lot of Matt Mercer's subclasses that he makes have uh, increases to initiative for characters. Same thing for his uh, his gunslinger subclass as well. Grants bonuses to initiative. Um, because, yeah, to be fair, there are very few things in the game that grant any kind of bonuses to a character's initiative. There are only, I think, what? At this point with this, as well as the gunslinger, what, three subclasses that get bonuses? There's but the it's also paladin. the swashbuckler. The paladin? There's a, there's a paladin that gives you a bonus to initiative okay. under aura. What is it? Oath of is that watchers? Or maybe that's yeah. maybe that's is it, it's either know. watchers or I think glory. it's watch I think it's watchers. It might be watchers or glory. But uh, yeah. so then four then. It's it's it would be gunslinger, chronogy, swashbuckler, and then like one of the paladin subclasses, I think. Um there might be more too. Maybe maybe mastermind. I forget. But either way, there aren't a lot of things that allow a character to increase their initiative beyond what just their dexterity modifier is. So this particular ability, especially because it allows you to add your intelligence modifier, which you are just naturally going to increase because you're a wizard and you want your intelligence. That's your primary stat. You're going to have a pretty decent initiative, most likely, especially because you also probably want to increase your dex, which will, again, give you just higher initiative as well as AC, because you're not going to have armor as a wizard. So, unless it's mage armor. But that being the case, this helps a lot, because it allows you to have a pretty high chance of going first in initiative, which allows you to, you know, prep some uh, buff spells or even debuff spells against your enemies and stuff before they have a chance to go. Uh, moving on from there, we have the sixth level ability known as Momentary Stasis. As an action, you can magically force a large or smaller creature you can see within 60 feet of you to make a con save against your spell save DC. Unless the saving throw is a success, the creature is then encased in a field of magical energy until the end of your next turn or until they take damage. Any damage. While encased in this way, the creature is incapacitated and has a speed of zero. You can, use number, you can use this feature a number of times equal to your intelligence modifier, a minimum of once, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So you can essentially just, like, incapacitate somebody, potentially. And you can use it a number of times equal to your intelligence mod. So it's basically like, you know, similar to a, uh, a hold person spell. Or technically it doesn't paralyze them, it just incapacitates them. But it, which... it just, it, you can take someone basically out of you can take away a turn, basically. So it's like you can make them just lose a turn because they can't take actions or reactions. Um, I feel like I feel like it's while well, in case this way, I feel like it should give them an extra like like a, 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 a status or whatever though. Like because it's so, literally, so it literally says the creature is encased in a field of magic. Like I feel like that's very similar to just being hold person or or True, like frozen or something but the the reality is incapacitated is the basic stat for not being able to yeah. move and then to not be able to do anything paralyzed is the first part of paralyzed is the creature's incapacitated is incapacitated and, and these other things yeah terrified is this creature's incapacitated, incapacitated and these yeah. other things so and stunned and unconscious so like incapacitated yeah. is just the basic version it is like in incapacitated again is just basically you are unable to take any actions or reactions like that's I, that's what that have, is and you have no speed i think yeah. the, re the reason it's like this is because you're not necessarily supposed to use this as a way to get like free attacks on somebody it's more of a we're just uh, stopping you you're, momentarily you're gonna, like because it's because it's time related right um if we're slowing you, were, you down yeah you're stuck for a second if we touch you you come back to this time which is why you yeah. can't like um but the reality is like it's it, it can come in handy um it's true if they fail to save again just giving you more turns to either heal like if you need to like heal and stuff or you need to give like uh, a, a teammate time to run away or something like yeah this this would work great because they they wouldn't be able to take reactions either so your teammate could just 
get the hell out of dodge if they're hurt yeah. um or, you know this is if you're fighting like a monster and he has chaff that you're having a trouble getting rid of because the big monster keeps beating the shit out of you you stop him from doing that from a turn and you guys can kind of regroup and reassess what's going on um yeah it's helpful because i mean it is it is until the end of your next turn meaning you could just keep trying to do this to them every turn as long you know as many times as you have, as your intelligence modifier would allow so you could just like use this as a means of like freeze 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 as you're just kind of trying to escape or yeah you know just whatever because obviously again if you do attack him then they're free and they can still act on their turn but if you don't do anything to them when their turn comes around they they can't make any actions which also means that they can't move either well even their speed is zero but Technically, your movement is still like a move action, I guess. But either way, they, yeah. And I do believe bonus actions also count too. Like they cannot take a bonus yeah, action. Yeah, it's actions, uh, plural, both actions. So again, not not a bad ability at all. You know, not it doesn't necessarily, it, it is much more, I believe, a more defensive, like, you know, escape kind of ability overall. But that there are plenty of moments where that can come in super handy. Uh, this class on. is fairly defensive. It's it's very defensive. It's it's again, and that's one of the reasons why I and I think a lot of people do like it. I mean, hell, even even specific spells that come along with this. Although any wizard at this point can st still still technically use all of the spells now that are associated with these classes, but still, this one, like, it's one of the, again the few subclasses that allows you abilities that directly affect enemies and can like defend against enemy stuff uh in a very direct manner um that being the case moving on to level 10 you get the ability known as arcane abeyance when you cast a spell using a spell slot of fourth level or lower you can condense the spell's magic into a moat the spell is frozen in time at the moment of casting and held within a gray bead for one hour this bead is a tiny object with AC 15 and one hit point, and it is immune to poison and psychic damage. When the duration ends, if the bead is destroyed, it or if the bead is destroyed, it vanishes in a flash of light and the spell is lost. A creature holding the bead can use its action to release the spell within, whereupon the bead disappears. The spell uses your spell attack bonus and save DC, and the spell treats the creature who released it as the caster for all other purposes. Once you create a bead with this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a short or a long rest. So you can basically, for one hour, just have like a contingency spell for like yourself or a friend, and be basically be like, "Here, take this." Like you have a uh, spell of haste that you can just pop off on yourself, um, and it allows them too because they are the caster; they're the ones who have concentration on that spell now. So you could give it to like a a barbarian or a fighter or a paladin who all probably have decent constitution and probably have constitution saves or whatever. And they could be a menace. They could be an absolute menace because they're the ones because they're not going to be casting any other spells, too, for that matter. Especially a uh, although I, I guess technically with a with a uh, a barbarian, they wouldn't be able to because if they go into rage, then they, they couldn't concentrate on the spell. So. Technically, it would probably be best to use it on a fighter or a paladin who they don't necessarily need to use concentration spells um, at all. I mean, heck, even maybe even like a rogue or a monk would be great uh, to use it on because it, their speed would increase a ton for the monk as well as like getting some extra AC for the uh, for both the monk and the and the rogue. Like an extra attack also would be great and helpful um but yeah definitely a a helpful ability to have obviously the only real restriction is the fact that it only lasts for an hour so you have to keep that in mind you can't do it like you, you can't just be like i'm gonna save this up for eight hours just for a full day it's like it does have to have some initial like strategic prep i would say um moving on to the final capstone ability of the subclass it is known as convergent future you can peer through possible futures and magically pull one of them into events around you, ensuring a particular outcome. When you or a creature you can see within 60 feet of you makes an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw, you can use your reaction to ignore the die roll and decide whether the number rolled is the minimum needed to succeed 
or one less than that number. Your choice. When you use this feature, you gain one level of exhaustion, and only by finishing a long rest can you remove a level of exhaustion gained in this way. So this, this is a very powerful ability. Um, and I do really love how Matt kind of offset it by giving you that caveat or that that detriment of exhaustion. And you can only get rid of this exhaustion by long resting. You can't use like greater restoration or whatever. You can maybe do a wish spell, but like this thing basically just means that you can just make either someone succeed or fail at any check within 60 feet of you. And even more so, it's kind of an extra FU because it's like they they literally <laughs> fail by one less than what they would have needed, regardless of what they roll. So it's like you, again, you have like a, a an individual who does a saving throw, succeeds on a saving throw against like a uh, a disintegrate spell, right? And they're like, yeah, I succeeded. And you're like, uh, no, you don't. Convergent future. <laughs> And they're just going to take that damage. Now, again, you do get exhaustion. But the first exhaustion, you're only going to have disadvantage on, a, on ability checks at that point. Um, and essentially, like... I mean, it is just the way of, like, if you have a big bad and you have something that's going to fuck them up and you want to yeah. make sure that they don't save. It is it is one of those things, like... You, it, you have to make the choice... The right choice at the right time, but man, if you do, it's a huge thing. Or even like, for instance, if you you could do this with a creature who has technically failed death saves, like a death saving throw. If they failed the save, you can change you, it. You could technically change it. And to be fair, you can do this as many times as you have exhaustion levels. Now, again, the more you do it, the heavier the toll. Again. As you accrue exhaustion points, you will inevitably end up dying. Like if you get six exhaustion points, I believe is is where you die. The first level of exhaustion, not terrible. You only have ability checks at disadvantage. Second level, I believe it's attack rolls as well, I think. Or maybe it's speed. I, I think it may be your speed is half. Uh, third level is when it's like attack rolls. Uh, and saving throws, I believe. I think I think I'm wrong about that. Hang on, I should even just I can even just freaking check it real quick with a character because I think first level, yeah, first level is definitely your ability checks are disadvantage. I think second level is when your speed is halved. Um, bloop, bloop. Yeah, so first level disadvantage on ability checks. Second level, your speed is halved. Third level, you have disadvantage on attack rolls and saving throws. That's huge. And then fourth level, your hit point maximum is then halved. Fifth level, your speed is reduced to zero. So you cannot move. And then sixth level, you just die. You're just dead. Yeah. So you technically could do this a maximum of six times, but you're really not going to want to. Like, it's it's... At most, you probably only really want to do this twice in any combat if you can help. Because the problem to being, you can't get rid of this anyway except for long resting. Meaning that you would have to long rest. Again, depending on if you, how many times you do it, you would have you would have that permanently that exhaustion would be permanent until you long rest the amount of times that you have exhaustion. So this this is a huge. I I I love these kinds of abilities too because these are. It is a very powerful ability, but it also is one that's like, hey, if you are not careful, this could be hugely detrimental to you. And it, it, it could like it could change up the nature of an encounter like super quick in a multitude of ways where at first, hey, you saved that guy. But now you have disadvantage on all ability checks. Hey, you saved him again, but now your speed is halved and you can't move nearly as fast. And then finally, you 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 get disadvantage on on ability check or on attack rolls and saving throws, and that dude now targets you because you keep saving people in those clutch moments, and you you can't get rid of it. Like you're you're in a dungeon, and you have to either long rest to get rid of it, or you are stuck now with yeah. disadvantage on basically everything. It's a it, it's it's a it's a big one, but it's it's definitely amazing and cool. Uh, for what it gives you and for what it 
potentially risks for you. Um, but overall, this is also why this particular subclass is hugely popular. A lot of people really like this subclass because it's so badass and broken. A lot of GMs hate this subclass because it's so broken in a number of ways, because it allows so much defense. Like again, this subclass is primarily built around essentially screwing with your enemies, defending and like making all of your enemies and sometimes even your, your uh, allies successes into failures and protecting or just shutting down the successes of other people. You can also in some of them though, help people to succeed as well, of course, too. Um, that is also a potential thing you can do. But overall, highly powerful subclass, really fun and interesting because of its ability to control and manipulate the battlefield and your enemies or even your allies to a very potent extent. Uh, but with that being said, let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, group of subclass that we're talking about. Uh, Sammy, go ahead, take it away. Yeah, I have the Way of Mercy monk. Um, they're kind I of have like played one of these before. Yeah, they are fun. I have as well. They're fun. So they kind of talk about them like maybe they're in like a religious order or just they're they're healers ostensibly, um, but they're monks, so they beat the shit out of people too, which is fun. Um, right. at their level, pressure points and acting yeah. points and stuff, which is cool. At their level, when you choose this subclass, you gain proficiency in the insight and medicine skills, and you gain proficiency with the herbalism kit. You also gain a special mask, which you often wear while using the features of this subclass. You determine its appearance or generate it randomly by rolling on the merciful mask table. Uh, some of the options are um a raven mask a blank white mask a crying visage laughing visage skull or a butterfly obviously you can do whatever you want but uh, obviously yeah. the plague the plague doctor raven mask is iconic it's a super cool i one. do love the crying visage like yeah but like the laughing visage or whatever yeah like, just imagine just a solid white like pewter mask with just the crying face on it that would be kind of terrifying yeah. um or just like a skull literally like a yeah. skull mask yeah that'd be cool you just like Ooh. um yeah, and then like Cinco de Mayo. Oh, yeah. oh, that'd be cool. And then you also get Hand of Healing at third level and Hand of Harm. Uh, Hand of Healing. Your Mystic Touch can mend wounds. Uh, as an action, you can spend one key point to touch a creature and restore a number of hit points equal to a roll of your martial arts die plus your Wisdom modifier. When you use your Flurry of Blows, you can replace one of the unarmed strikes with the use of this feature without spending a key point for the healing. At third level, with Hand of Harm, you use your key to inflict wounds. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, you can spend one key point to deal extra necrotic damage equal to one roll of your martial arts die, plus your wisdom modifier. You can use this feature only once per turn. Now, what this allows you to do is, at least for right now, if you're fighting with another melee fighter on your team, uh, or someone else that's in the front or midline with you, you can, for all intents and purposes, spread your attacks around to both do extra damage to enemies, or if you need to, throw hit points into your allies. A little extra bolt, like, you know, a little, um, a little cure wounds. There is, also, you know? there is also nothing on here saying that you can't heal yourself. I was going to say, you can just punch yourself real quick. Just you can tap heal yourself. yourself. Uh, which is super cool. Um, to build on that, at 6th level, you get Physician's Touch. You can administer even greater cures with a touch. And if you feel it's necessary, you can use your knowledge to cause harm. <laughs> when you use hand of healing on a creature necessary. yeah when you use hand of healing on a creature you can also end one disease or one of the following conditions affecting the creature blind and blinded deafened paralyzed poisoned or stunned you can just end it as part of the uh, hand of healing or when you use your hand of harm you can subject the creature to the poison condition until the end of your next turn now they do not save against that no if you hit the attack and use hand of harm you can just poison them. Yep. They just get poisoned. <laughs> awesome. It's because then great. they're going to have disadvantages on attack rolls and ability checks. Yep. Um, and there is no saving throw. doesn't matter if they have advantage on saving nah, throws. Nah. If if the only thing that, I was going to say, if they're immune to that, I it, guess it's, don't, it doesn't don't do fight, anything. Don't fight anything from the lower planes. Yeah, anyway. literally. That's, that's, that's the one issue, is obviously a lot of evil shit is normally immune to poison. Unfortunately, lower planes you can kill a bunch of evil shit in the Feywild if you want. Uh, um, but they're not as well. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. depends. Like, 
but then to build even on a lot your... of them are technically immune to poison though too like, yeah i was gonna say even they have a some lot of, them are, of poison some immunity. of them are immune to the poison damage but not the poison condition it's also weird there there are plenty of things like that where you're like oh it doesn't there's, take there's damage two... but so it there... can be poison for okay. context there's two poisons yep there's poison damage and being poisoned being poisoned doesn't necessarily mean you're going to take poison damage so it, no i get it, it. i yeah. get that there's some things that i just kind of had to fuck around with i i well i also understand because it's basically like oh you're you are you know it, it's not a disease but it's like you are getting sick from the point yeah. from being po- like not even, some, you, don't, you don't you don't take damage from it that like no, hurts but just, your body just reacts to it in a yeah. poor manner it sucks it's like allergies, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. it's like, you know, hey, you're, like you're having an allergic reaction to this thing. Yeah. But to build on this healing and harm dual fist kind of things at 11th level, you get flurry of healing and harm. You can now uh, make out a flurry of comfort and hurt. When you use flurry of blows, oh, you can now replace hurt. each of the unarmed strikes with the use of your hand of healing without spending key points for the healing. So you could for every flurry of blows attack heal somebody you, you in get, addition you two more two extra so it'd be 2d8 instead of just the one huh you, you can you can do you could healing hand twice now instead of just the one so you would get you could do 2d8 to yeah. either one person or spread it around more yeah then you also when you make an unarmed strike with flurry of blows you can hand of harm with that strike without spending the key point for hand of harm you can still use Hand of Harm only once per turn. So you basically are just getting free Hands of Harm every turn, which is nice. Only once, though, which is a little but unfortunate. Like, otherwise, but... using it before, you had to spend a key point every time. Now, as long as you do... Oh, no, as long as you do Flurry, flurry of Blows, yeah. Yeah, Flurry of Blows, and sure, yeah, it's... uh. It's fun. I do enjoy it. You're building. I mean, it's like you, you know, have, you're going to have more uses. You're going to be using this stuff more often. That's what this ability does. It, it because you're that... already going to be using flurry of blows a ton anyway, and so yeah. it's like now you just you don't have to use as many resources for it, which is nice. Um, yeah. So it's just building on what you already do. Um, and then the cool bit at the end here with its, I guess the class cap, or the subclass capstone is hand of ultimate mercy. Uh, you master your mastery of life energy opens the door to ultimate mercy as an action you can touch the corpse of a creature that died within the past 24 hours and expend five key points the creature then returns to life regaining a number of hit points equal to 4d10 plus your wisdom modifier if the creature died while subject to any of the following conditions it immediately revives them with the condition removed blinded deafened paralyzed poisoned and stunned once you use this feature you can't use it again until you finish a long rest but you can just fucking you can just revive life. somebody as an action you can just you can just you know and five key points but at 17th level you're gonna be able to spare five key points most likely unless you're just going ham with them key points for some reason uh which you probably will be fighting certain things at 17th level to be fair you're gonna be spending them key points quick well what's nice but, is it's also 24 hours which means if you run out of key points you can short rest and then revive your course yep this is true um yeah, this is great. And it also um, brings them back again with a number of hit points equal to 4d10 plus width. So it's not even just like so you can do that in the middle. You can do that in the middle of the fight. Yeah, and they and they still wouldn't necessarily be like you could potentially get as much as four like over 40 points of health back for them, which is nothing to sneeze at. No uh at max. But it's it's but... also it's also uh just to remind everybody, every other way of reviving except for revivify takes time. Yeah, it takes a long and, time, and it can leave a lot of the people, like, exhausted yeah, from the exertion. This doesn't do any of that. It's nope. just, your friend could literally get hit with a boulder, die, fall right next to you, and as they're falling on your turn, you can just go, no, yep. <laughs> and like, they're back. Think um, of it, it's just of, it's just a better, it's a better revivify, basically. That, that doesn't cost any spell slots, and... Costs five key points, but yeah. you can get those back at a short rest if you survive. And mm-hmm. on top of that, you can then he at that point too, you can technically, as an action, heal them or bring them back from the dead. Yeah. I don't think unfortunately, I don't I, I don't know if they added like an, another like uh optional rule, but I don't you can't technically flurry of blows because you didn't do the attack action. Um mm, yeah, I don't think so. But <laughs> next turn though, you can attack something run over to them because you're going to have like godlike speed at this point anyway 
And then Flurry of Blows, heal them 2d8 plus your, your wisdom modifier at that point too. Like, so you can, like, here's the thing about this subclass, right? Sam and I both played it. Let me know what you think about this too, Sam. Like, for me, I've played this subclass before and it's, as far as monk subclasses go, it's very straightforward. Again, same thing for a lot of the classes we talked about today. It's nothing super flashy. I mean, the only flashy one, honestly, today we talked about is Chronergy Magic, most likely, is the most flashy one. But this is not flashy at all. It is literally very straightforward. It It is highly dependent upon Flurry of Blows, which is still nice because you're going to be using Flurry of Blows all the time. But even like, you know, the healing, the healing it. It's not anything really big. It's again, it's a D8. Or well, technically, with your martial arts die, as you get higher in level, it increases. So it starts off like a D4, and then I think at third level, you think I think you get a D6 no, at third level. It's a D6 at fifth level. Okay, so you're gonna start off with a with a D4, and then you'll get a D6, and then you're gonna D8, you're gonna get a D8, and then a D10 for the final thing. Yeah. Um, and so it's like you know, it it won't it, it gets better for sure, which is nice, always great. But even then, it's technically still going to be a, essentially akin to just having a cure wound spell for for a lot of it. It's not. It's gonna. It's not even like like essentially. Yeah, it's going to be around a cure wounds, and obviously, you don't have the option of being able to increase the healing by like increasing like the spell slot that you use for it. But it is, you know, it it it, it is a cool kind of like battlefield medic almost is how I view this where. You're in the thick of things with your friends. And like Sam said, you have like, you know, a fellow melee combatant, like a barbarian or a fighter or a paladin, and you can just help bolster their defense, right? Like if they're tank, if they're the frontline tank, you get in there, you do a couple of quick jabs, you know, here or there to get some hits on with the with the flare of blows, and then you just tap them to help just heal them a little bit. You just help offset some of the damage that they are maybe taking and, and tanking for you. And then you like drop back or whatever. Like it's still a really cool and interesting subclass as also just flavor wise. Again, the mask is a cool addition. Uh, the ability for them to just offer a little extra support here or there, cause they can move. They, you guys can move all around the battlefield. Um, but it's definitely going to not, it, I, I don't want anybody going into this thing that they're going to, again, all of a sudden become like, you know, their mainstream, you know, healer and, no. and, and whatever. Cause it's like, you are far from a healer. You're an off healer at best. And if, yeah, at best. And like, the reality is, is like having someone like this is nice because, you know, having this as a backup where you can ostensibly just be like, you know, save someone from going down. Um, yeah. Bring sure them back clerics, up. You know, or make sure, help make sure yourself. You're, if you have a cleric as well, or a full healer, which you should, um, you can make sure that so. full you make sure that full healer also stays up. So, you know, it's little things like they're not meant to be healers. They're meant. I mean, it is really nice once you hit sixth level, being able to remove diseases or conditions off of people is huge. That's so really blind, helpful. like blindness, deafness, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. There's a lot of things that 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 can really fuck up your day. Oh, um, and like being able to run out there and, and stop one of your friends from having that problem in the heat of battle there's not a lot of spells that just do that like it or yeah. or it's a big it's a big resource. it's a big spell it's a big resource this isn't this isn't a big resource no. and you can do it often enough that you know you can be the antithesis to a creature that's trying to like stun your friends um not to mention that like monks aren't they're they're setup characters they're not the damage dealers no. a monk is great because i can run in stun somebody top my buddy's hit points off and maybe remove the fact that he's poisoned and then back away and now that stun guy that's in front of my fighter is going to get the shit kicked out of him by the ranger hiding in the bushes and the fighter right in front of me like it's they're not you're not going to be the center of attention but you're going to help facilitate which is why that's I like that's usually monks in a nutshell monks monks will never be the big damage dealer of any party Unless like no matter no matter, I mean, even open hand until you get like that 17th level capstone yeah. ability, you're still not going to be the primary damage dealer of the party, like at any yeah. point. Monks are chip, they're chippers. Monks are chip yeah. damage. And they're they are they are chip damage, and they're usually very hard to take out in a number of ways because they, they have a lot of abilities that allow them to like defend themselves or like, you know, 
heal themselves or protect themselves. Like, usually at higher levels. Lower level monks, it can be pretty easy to take them out because they, they haven't built up enough key points to really, like, you know, do a lot of stuff or protect themselves. It, it, they, they are very limited. High level monks, though, they can be incredibly dangerous and super annoying because they have the ability to not only, like, shut a lot of enemies down with just the stunning strike alone, but even to, again, like, ranged attacks that aren't magical. They can just stop that shit, you know, or at least once, obviously, because they only have one reaction. But they can still do that. Ranged attacks become nothing. They can jump off of incredibly high structures, buildings, cliffs, without taking any real damage. They can run across vertical surfaces and on water and stuff. Like, they they are super cool and badass at higher levels and, and become very difficult and a high nuisance because of their ability to just control and affect everything around them without without them really being able to be affected in any way because they can also like if somebody frightens them or charms them they can just stillness of mind as an action they can just get rid of that it's not a thing anymore for them they're just like yeah no you know so but they will they are not about being high damage dealers like you can get up there if you have a certain item and stuff equipped and you're just dealing you know you're attacking this this dude four times in a row and even with this like hand of harm you get an extra d8 or d10 you know of necrotic damage you know plus your wisdom modifier so yeah. it's like it's not nothing but it's also obvious it's still not it's still not particularly substantial or big for you but it's still just like hey you know hey you know what though get get a monk weapon though you have a monk weapon like you you, you do the uh the dedicated weapon ability the optional feature get a like a you know you can get a flame tongue weapon and now and now maybe you will be doing some decent damage you can attack like twice with a flame tongue and then flurry of blows and then one of those is your hand of harm like that's not that's not meaty that's not that's not small damage at that point so there are ways that you can be decent but you're still probably not going to be ever as like explosive as no, many others you're going to be annoying very so very much so um you're going to be constantly out here you know making sure your friends don't fall making sure enemies kind of stay in a place uh keeping your friends from being stunned and things of that nature like you are a combat medic oh yeah but but emphasis on the medic you're not a healer you yeah you patch someone up to make sure they can keep going you don't you you're you don't have <laughs> you don't have a lot of permanent solutions to things no. that are like you know it's 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 quick fixes you got you got a number of real quick fixes and and they can get somebody back in the game you know yeah then that, that again i mean look the the seventeenth level ability and the sixth level ability are pretty big they, they, they help out a lot like but for those those though yeah those those statuses nothing to sneeze at if you get hit with one of those it can and be pretty also, bad I mean, this is up to you. I would say that that also the twenty four hour thing would also still work if you use gentle repose. Yeah, because it's not a spell, but it says it effectively extends the time limit on raising target from the dead since days spent on the influence of the spell don't count against the time limit of spells such yep. as raise dead. So, like technically, if you have someone that knows gentle repose or have an ability or like some way to use gentle repose, spare the dying or whatever, there, or you can once a day revive somebody that's pretty yeah. big you know being able to go and like like that's almost like you could make money doing that yeah 100 um, percent easy 100%, like, like, and as just... well as long as they have died within 24 hours of course yeah. like that's that is the only real caveat or like sam said they have used gentle repose to ex to preserve the body um but you could totally yeah just do that like you know but it, it, it's and it's a powerful ability for a reason like it's that that is a true 17th level like capstone ability there being able to just revive again you it's literally just a better revivify yeah. in almost every way like because you, you heal them a decent amount and it takes five key points you can only do it once every long rest but still it also cures blinded deaf and paralyzed point. like if they're if they're still technically gone to be fair i will say though i feel like most tables if you like go down if you actually like die without while, while still technically having one of these statuses or whatever on you i think most of the time you're just kind of cleared of those statuses anyway so like but if at any point the gm wants to try and make an argument that well you're still this it's like actually well i think the reason not. the reason it's saying this is because technically um if you say you're in a fight where someone casts blindness on you 
and you go down, if they're still holding concentration on that spell, yeah, there's no there's reason, no reason get, why you if you were to get back be... up, you would still be blind. Yeah. Um, so I think this is because this is supposed to be used in the middle of combat. Fair. The fact that it heals you more, the fact that there's no adverse effects to you dying and then coming back. I... Fact, you know what I mean? Like, it's one of those things, like, in the middle of a fight, your your friend goes down. Yeah, normally Boom. they have to go down. I mean, yeah. I, I will say, and a lot of the time, a lot of those spells do have caveats saying, like, you have to target a creature. Technically speaking, once you officially die, your body is no longer a creature, yeah. but it's an object now. Yeah. So, like, again, I, I, point being, though, is, again, there there is certain precedents where GMs could maybe make an argument that, well, you're still under this effect. But with this, it just you're just not. It doesn't matter. Fuck, maybe you're cursed. I don't know. Like there, there could be something. There could be certain things. Either way, with this, it just means that that those conditions are now they're gone now. Yeah. Any if you at at any point, if anybody wants to try to make an argument that you still have some of these conditions on you, even if you came back with this, they do not. They are gone. Yeah. Um. So that still just that helps to increase the value of this ability. Beyond it just being like a better revivify where, hey, now you also have some hit points back too, potentially, you know? So still great. Still awesome. The ability to, again, like combat medic, just give a little extra survivability to yourself or to your friends, a little bit extra, you know, control, um, and even a little bit extra damage doesn't hurt. You know, it doesn't hurt. Uh, overall, but I still feel a fun subclass. I enjoyed it when I played it. I just, again, for any of you guys looking for something like a little bit more, like just, just be aware you are not going to be like an Uber healer by any means. You're, you're still going to kind of just primarily be doing, you know, the thing that monks do, which is just punch and kick a lot is just primarily what you're going to be doing. So just, just manage your expectations kind of like that, you know, a bit. Um, Anything else about the Way of Mercy, Monk, my friend? No, that was it. That's it. All I, right. I think it's fun. Let's. It It is a fun subclass. Again, I did enjoy playing it myself. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to then the final subclass that we'll be discussing for today. Uh, again, a, an infamous fan favorite, but also kind of a, some of a, a fan loathing, loathment, I guess, if that's a word. The Oathbreaker Paladin. Now, an Oathbreaker Paladin... Uh, essentially is a paladin who breaks his or her sacred oath shocker i know right to pursue some dark ambition or serve an evil power whatever light burned in the paladin's heart previously has been extinguished and only darkness now remains a paladin must be evil and at least third level to become an oath breaker the paladin replaces the features specific to his or her sacred oath with the oath breaker features instead um, now, obviously, you don't necessarily have to start out technically as like a, a different paladin to then become an no. oathbreaker because you take it, your oath before you get the abilities from it. Yeah, so it's like you can do this though. Like this, this is and and technically speaking, an oath like you can only really be an oathbreaker as it says if you're evil and if you're uh, deliberately trying to like whatever. You don't have to though. It's like not, it's, it's not evil. It's it's not that you're necessarily like the worst guy. Well, but it's using you don't have to be it's using a dark power to get what you need because the other powers didn't work exactly so, you know you can twist it as either you are evil and you're doing horrible things and you're more lawful so maybe there's like some good to be had or that you're or there's ambition... some honor you have, you have a code you have a mm -hmm. code of honor or ethics or something i think the other way to look at it is oath breakers aren't necessarily evil in the the they don't case. have to be, yeah. But they, they do not have they're, to. Be. They're accepting the fact that they're using power to do something, and things might go bad. But it's so they like need to get something done. <laughs> again, <laughs> think think about it. Like it 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 specifically stipulates in in the uh, subclass that an, a paladin must be evil and at least third level to become an oathbreaker. But think about it also like the other more like specific requirement subclasses like blade singer. Or uh, Battle Rager, uh, you know, Barbarian and, and Blade Singer Wizard. Technically, you you have to be, you know, a dwarf or an elf to have those subclasses. But that's also boring and annoying, right? You should still be free to be able to do it as long as you have, like, whatever. Same thing here. Like, you don't have to be evil necessarily to be an oath breaker. You can be an oath breaker if, you know, you end up just breaking your oath for some more selfish or other reason or whatever you know you, you lost your oath you broke the tenets 
of your previous thing. Now, you absolutely can be, but I, I also like the idea, for instance, like you can also be an evil like Paladin of Conquest or Paladin of Vengeance or Paladin of, you know, Ancients. Like you can you can be evil and be those other subclasses as well. Just like with this one, you don't have to be evil to be the subclass. You could just basically being like Sam said, taking power from a darker or more evil source that you're trying to use for maybe better or more benevolent purposes, you know? That being the case, Oathbreaker Paladins uh, gain, as with almost every uh, Paladin subclass, an extra amount of spells. Uh, third level, they gain Hellish, rebu hellish Rebuke and Inflict Wounds. Uh, inflict Wounds, Busted Spell, really good one, especially for Paladins, you know, if they want to do like a quick kind of like explosion kind of attack, although arguably you might still just do more damage by smiting with your multi-attack but uh hellish rebuke not bad also you get a bit of a reaction a lot of paladins don't really have a lot of reaction abilities so this one isn't bad either uh at fifth level you gain crown of madness and darkness those are okay ninth level animate dead and bestow curse again not terrible 13th level blight and confusion both pretty good spells. 17th level, Contagion and Dominate Person. Not bad. They're okay. Uh, again, nothing really to write home about. None of these spells are particularly like incredible or crazy, but they do fit the theme, obviously, of the Oathbreaker. Um, and they absolutely can still be applicable and effective. Uh, you get two Channel Divinity options at third level, as with most Paladin subclasses. You get Control Undead. As an action, the paladin targets one undead creature he or she can see within 30 feet of him or her. The target must make a wisdom saving throw. On a fail save, the target must obey the paladin's commands for the next 24 hours or until the paladin uses this channel of video option again. Uh, an undead whose challenge rating is equal to or greater than the paladin's level is immune to this effect, so you do have to be stronger than the uh, the undead. That can still be cool, because that once you get to 20th level, you can potentially like dominate freaking vampires or like mummies and stuff like that like you know i think mummy lords even how like i don't think mummy lords are challenge rating 20 or higher right so let me check real quick because you could just straight up like monsters no no no, no not mun me mummy and how many challenge of any charges you uh yeah so a mummy lord is only challenge rating 15 so once you get to 16 you could dominate a mummy lord and usually channel divinity it depends like a lot of the time channel divinity is like usually only once like once every short or long rest i believe um but i don't know the problem being is paladins use it differently in a weird kind of way um getting on class features Trying to figure out when the fuck you get. Well, because you get a channel divinity. Your oath allows you to channel divinity. Da, 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 da. When you use channel divinity, you must finish your long rest to use your channel divinity. Yeah. So. So you only have one use. Um. Again, it's 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 always like. I think it is just once. I mean, it might be two because you have two separate effects. Like technically, I believe it's it like i think for clerics it's usually just once like you have to choose one or the other but then because it says when you channel divinity you choose which option to use you must then finish a short or long rest to use your channel divinity again so that does give the idea that you oh have, so you it's, only it's use once, it once per once yeah. per short rest once per short or long that's rest, fine yeah. because okay the reason i'm saying that is because if you were to bag yourself a really good undead yeah. that you're controlling and then you want to re-up the um what's it called the control the domination you'd, ha you'd have to like lock yourselves in a room with this undead do it again and if it fails like that's the hard part you'd have to be able yeah. to make sure that you trap it so you could re exert well it. again it's it's so it's, yeah, it's every short rest so you you could just keep re-upping it every hour potentially or at least you know every time you it would just take you an hour to get a short rest so or so well, you the, could the, just the problem is is that they if they save if they make the saving well throw, you, don't have to you could them. technically just command them to fail it though they have to obey your commands like so you could oh. just you you could just command them to keep failing the save. yeah you can yeah they they have to obey yeah 
So that's what I'm saying. You could you could you could get a mummy lord who can then make his own undead, which listens to the mummy lord, and you just keep commanding the mummy lord to just fail the save for him to just re-up the control undead on him. So this is like I I have used this same kind of concept, like to be like, you could make a really cool badass like BBEG oathbreaker with yeah. like an undead minion, or even having if their own undead mm -hmm. horde, because like the mummy lord has uh where, where is it animate dead um as well as though they can just they have rejuvenation which is great um let's see dreadful glare let's see become frightened those are reactions blinding dust blasphemous word channel negative energy Yeah, like they they can they can cast like their own shit. They they have animate dead, so they they can also just make their own undead. Divination, guardian, dispel magic, hold person, silence command. If they have. Yeah, so Gunner Skeleton. So they you you could you could dominate a, a mummy lord, get some more corpses or whatever for it to then animate and excuse me, technically it, it I don't see why it couldn't it has six level spell slots. So it could technically cast animate dead at like six level if it wanted to, yeah. as well as every other level. So it could cast it at sixth level once, fifth level twice, fourth level three times, and then third level three times. So you could create either some very powerful undead minions for the Mummy Millard, or just make a ton of like skeletons and zombies. Like literally have your own little undead horde. And then the Mummy Lord would just have to take a long rest to then get back its spell slots. You could take a long rest. You could command it to fail the save of your control dead again that you just get back. And then just do it over and then just do it again to like maintain control of those undead. Because what animate dead lasts for 24 hours, right? Yeah. The the undead creatures are are under your control, are under the mummy lord's control for 24 hours. So then yeah, you you could you could pretty easily make a, a decent sized uh undead horde with this because you could also like for instance with animate dead i think you can create like a white or something right like flip oh no no you you can just make that that's a higher level ability i'm sorry that, that that's create undead right animate undead is you just you can just basically have uh a lot of uh undead Either a lot of zombies or a lot of skeletons or a mixture of both. So yeah, you can just create an undead zombie slash skeleton horde with with this, which is that's that's pretty cool. Like for again for a channel divinity, like and you, obviously you'd have to be sixteenth level at least for this to work. But still, if you're if you are in a campaign where you are fighting undead, you also get a certain ability. Your aura affects undead making them even more powerful and stuff too which we'll get into now as a matter of fact uh or a little bit later um so that's actually only one of the channel divinities is control undead the other channel divinity is dreadful aspect as an action the paladin channels the darkest emotions and focuses them into a burst of magical menace each creature of the paladin's choice within 30 feet of the paladin must make a wisdom saving throw if it can see the paladin on a failed save the target is frightened for one frightened of the paladin paladin for one minute if a creature frightened by this effect ends its turn more than 30 feet away from the paladin, it can attempt another wisdom saving throw to end the effect on it. Mm -hmm. So basically, like, each creature of the paladin's choice. Yeah, on a failed save. So basically, it do, it's not like a continuous thing, but it's basically when he activates the dreadful aspect, each creature of the paladin's choice within 30 feet of it has to make this save. And if they fail, they are then frightened for one minute. And unless, of course, they can get 30 feet away from the Paladin to then attempt another Wisdom save. So that's not bad. Like, it's not terrible. They, although to be fair, they they can do that, though, because, like, they could either attempt to fight them, which would be a disadvantage, 
They can't move closer to him, so they could just use their action to then dash away from him 60 feet at least to then make another attempt at the wisdom saving throw. Um, but that does cost them their action to do. And it it, it does have to be uh they have to end their turn more than 30 feet away. Mm-hmm. So not 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 terrible. It's not horrible. It's not amazing, but not terrible. Um, especially for how it can uh how that particular ability could potentially help uh synergize with a later on ability. Um, but moving on, we have at seventh level the ability known as Aura of Hate. Uh the paladin, as well as any fiends and undead within 10 feet of it, gain a bonus to melee weapon damage rolls equal to the paladin's charisma modifier, minimum of one. A creature can benefit from this feature from only one paladin at a time. Uh, and at 18th level, all the paladin's auras increase to 30 feet. So this isn't bad at all. Again, like we were talking about that undead horde we had before. Obviously, one of the maybe the downsides of it is like, you know, you have a lot of them, but they're not very strong. Well, with this, both the paladin and any undead or fiends within 10 feet or at 18th level, 30 feet, they just get a baseline increase to their damage equal to the char- paladin's charisma modifier, which isn't going to yeah, be small. Also, um, just to put it out there. If you yourself have 20 charisma, you get a plus five bonus to all your damage rolls on melee weapons. Including if, you're, if, you're, if your strength is at 20, you get so a plus be, 10, yeah, be plus to, 10 to all damage. <laughs> That's insane. Just, just baseline, not including if you have a plus three weapon. So you get you have a plus thirteen damage. Oh, and that's I, I will say this too. It means that you don't necessarily have to pump strength if you want to have more no. charisma on your character. Because once you hit level seven, instead of, I mean, it's not it's not going to act. Your plus to hit will be lower. So that's the only problem. Yeah. So again, you, guess, you still you still honestly, do want to pump strength, but it's, again, it's still like you you're going to be pumping charisma too yeah. because you want I would honestly just your say your aura uh, also will still provide you with protection you you would get aura of protection just as a paladin yeah. so you yeah, just you would want to get your saving charisma. throws and shit like and cuz obviously the paladin with their magic you don't really have a lot of like spells that require enemies to make saves or for you to like attack them with your with your magic um obviously most of that's just going to be like your your smite spells is like oh you have to make a save for certain other effects but it's or in still, this case anime did uh-huh. yeah it's still it's still worth it to increase your your charisma though because just even for the for the bonus of de- defense for saving throws like it's still worth it and this makes it even more worth it because it increases not just your defense but also your damage and not just your damage but the damage of any undead which you should have because if you have control undead get yourself like a cool undead you could even get like a freaking a a a true vampire i believe you could literally dominate a true vampire and then like while a lot of them have a lot of weaknesses and stuff but they also they, they can do a lot of damage again you get a if you can dominate let me let me just see just to be sure here but if you could dominate a true vampire and you could just have them. Vampire. Yeah, the challenge is only 13. So if you dominate technically a true vampire and you just have them start like biting people, you could technically have a whole horde of vampires. Yeah. You could you could have a true vampire and then like a like ghouls, like 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 you know, uh, spawn vampires and shit. Like or I mean, you know, at 20th level or at 17th or at 18th level, you could get a uh, Dracolich. Wait, really? Drac- there's, Dracoliches? There, there's CR 17. Oh adult, my god! Adult Dracolich. That might be harder because they have fucking uh, uh, legendary resistances, although maybe also vampires do too, now that I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Where... Where still yeah, yeah, they have a, so, so if you can get rid of their legendary resistances, though, like, if you can basically be like, hey, we're going to drop, yeah, and then control undead on a Dracolich? Oh, my God. Dude, absolutely. That That is BBEG, or even, I guess, just character thing, too. Like, that would be, that would I be mean, crazy. You, if you wanted to get something a little bit lower level that doesn't have... Uh, I mean, even a shadow. If you get, like, a shadow... Well... No, those yeah, are actually here, here's, here's another one that would be cool. A tropal? They're huge titans. No, they are undead. 
but they're undead atropals they um they can summon wraiths yeah on a recharge six and uh they have resistance to magic they um what is it let me find the other thing they have turn resistance they can drain people's life away (laughs) um yeah it would be pretty cool and destructive here's a question again you can dominate a shadow uh basically right away and shadows have that ability that neat little ability called strength drain yeah also at seventh level obviously one of the one of the um (laughs) one of the uh the caveats or whatever of a shadow is it's very deadly very dangerous but its ability to hit and attack is only a plus four to hit and it only deals 2d6 plus two necrotic damage however if on a hit, the target strength score is reduced by 1d4 yeah. every time. And the target will die if it's if this reduces its strength to zero. Uh, otherwise, the reduction does last until the target finishes a short or long rest. Yeah. Um, but if a non-evil humanoid dies from this attack... You do not control... New... Yeah, but you won't control that one. That's what I'm wondering. Like, it's like a no, new shadow rises from the corpse it's a new. Later. It's a new entity. It is. It is new, but it's like... It, it doesn't work. It, it, it won't attack another shadow, though. No, but it would attack you. Maybe. But yes. <laughs> I'm trying to see. I'm trying to see how this could work. I, th- I think. I think Wanda said this. This. This could work, though. This could. It, it could work. You need another. You need more people to be able to control more shadows, which I guess you could do with a I mean... Right? Because there's. Well, but no. But yeah. that's the thing, though. Like, like, because certain. I, I, hang on, because like, like, again, certain creatures when they kill others, they rise. But like, I mean, hang, this is—it's not white. under control, under anyone's control. That's yeah, the reality. yeah. I think if you had right, a if like, you had a necromancer with you and they would command undead, you could do that. But because like a white, for instance, yeah, because it specifically if you have a white, it does specifically say a humanoid slain by this attack rises twenty four hours later as a zombie under the white's control. Yeah, that's so. Different. If you if you dominated a white, yes, that that now, you could you could create a huge a big undead horde with a white. Yeah, the reality. Or, well, is, no more than twelve under its control. To be fair, the, but still, the, here's the reality with the whole yes, I control the white, which controls the zombies. There is going to be a case of middle management issues. Like you can't like, it's not you don't have control over the zombie. You have control over the white, and the white yeah. decides what to do with the zombie. Yeah, based can, off of what you, you tell can, it to do, though. Yeah, you can tell it what to do, but the, like the zombie you, you itself, could, you could still you, you you could still oh no, but I mean technically, I mean technically by extinction because if if the white listens to all of your orders, it tells like you could have it where the the zombies don't attack you. You could just be like the white will oh, tell yeah, the yeah. zombies not to attack yeah, you. One hundred percent. It's just it doesn't. No, you you can't necessarily directly. You could not tell the zombie, hey, don't do that. It it would look at the white like yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. For all intents and purposes, you I mean, be able yeah, to... it would still work. Like I'm, I'm trying. Like, hang on. I wonder if with the zombie lord, like, because animate dead allow. I think it only allows you to control zombies and or skeletons. Uh, skeletons. You can't. No. You wouldn't You're be looking able for to create undead. Yeah. Well, because I'm like, because that that would yeah, because that that's one that's one that allows you to create either like ghasts, ghouls, and whites. Yes. Um. Oops. I mean, I guess it's a, still, six, like, it's a six level spell. Yeah, I was going to say, like, technically, you could have your mummy lord learn it. Because it has think, six. I don't think, I don't think it, monsters can learn new spells, though. I mean, but, well, a mummy lord potentially could. Like, it's because it's, it's not, it's not unintelligent. Like, it's, it's literally, well, it's not super intelligent, to be fair. But I don't think any DM would. Uh... Yeah, I doubt that they would give you the option to add spells to your mummy lord. Uh, maybe. Oh, they're also he has cleric spells. Well, but that, that is a cleric spell though too. Yeah, uh, I guess create undead. Like is a create spell. create create undead is a cleric spell. So yeah, I mean, it's like I, I doubt that's he'd be also able to learn new that's also another reason why it's like it's because it's not even just like learning it. It's like as a cleric, if he's using cleric spells, it's like they can just they have access to all spells technically speaking but i don't um, think the mummy lord's actually a cleric anymore <laughs> uh i mean 
I don't know. There's 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 a reason it doesn't have the ability to create higher undead. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, it is unfortunate, but it's definitely an interesting thing to think about, though. Uh, anywho, <laughs> let's let's continue on here. Uh, moving on to the fifteenth level ability known as supernatural resistance. The paladin gains resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical weapons. Yeah, again, at this level, at fifteenth level, you're not so really gonna be. It can still come in handy sometimes. Maybe, but even then, you'd it's be like surprised. Like... You'd be surprised how many, even higher level monsters, don't have naturally magic weapons. Um, I mean, I, I, well, another issue. Here's the, here's here's the rub, right? If you're trying to play this subclass as anything other than like an evil character or an evil campaign, if you're fighting demons or or if you're fighting fiends and undead the problem being is one could make like hmm, based off of the text one could make an argument that oh hey your aura of hate also will empower any fiends and undead within 10 feet of you because that's technically what it says even though yeah. like yeah. Hang on. Let's let's even just let's 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 go back up to the normal paladin real quick and let's let's just see what the actual for like aura protection for instance. Um aura of courage. Yeah. So it says it, it specifically stipulates for like aura of protection or aura of courage. It's whenever you or a friendly creature within 10 feet of you must make a saving throw, the creature gains a bonus to the saving throw equal to your charisma modifier. Uh so technically speaking, like it, how they word it seems like the the paladin doesn't necessarily yeah, it, have. Well, Jeremy Crawford answered this. What did he say? It benefits the fiend or an undead, whether or not yeah. the creature is friendly toward the paladin. Yeah. So that well, that so, so point being is with the paladin, like that is that's a huge aspect of like, well, if you are facing any of these creatures, it also apparent will benefit them meaning if you're trying to be like a good campaign or heck even if you're just in a bad campaign and you're facing off against undead or fiends it does also benefit them which that that's not awesome that no. sucks um in a lot of ways that that sucks um and at 15th level you know resistance to non-magical bludgeon piercing and slashing probably not really going to be very applicable um or of hate is super applicable if you have like a horde of undead or some fiend, you know, a, a horde of fiends or whatever to help you out. But it's also like this particular subclass isn't awesome if you're not going evil or if yeah. you're or or only really awesome if it's like a a, uh, a GM using this subclass against your your uh, your players as, as a BBEG or as just like a, a some kind of boss like great for that. Not really awesome for a lot of players trying to play, especially if you're trying to play in a good campaign, um, which is kind of unfortunate. I, However, I, I would say, to be fair, for me, I have always subscribed to the belief that, like, aura abilities should only affect who a paladin wants or chooses to, like, who they feel are friendly to them or whatever. Technically here, the ability does specifically state, and Jeremy Crawford did confirm, on it's purpose any fiends and undead and that yeah. is a thing and and it was intentional yeah to do that um another thing to also be aware of as well is uh an oathbreaker paladin also has like their uh what is it i, be I believe like their their smites are also different aren't they their smites i thought dealt like either necrotic no. or like fire damage or something no i don't think so I thought, hang on, let me let me even see uh, for for no, it's still radiant damage. Okay, there's no it, the smites don't get changed at all. For some reason, I thought if you were an oathbreaker, like your either like your smites as well as like your improved smites change to a different uh to a different damage type for some reason. Um, <laughs> divine smite. Uh, yeah, no, I don't I don't think it does. Okay. Okay, so there, there, there's that at least. I'm, I'm glad that that isn't the case. But anywho, uh, moving on to the final twentieth level capstone ability. It is known as Dread Lord. At twentieth level, the paladin can, as an action, surround himself or herself with an aura of gloom that lasts for one minute. 
The aura reduces any bright light in a 30-foot radius around the paladin to dim light. And whenever an enemy that is frightened, uh -huh, see where that frightened comes into play, by the paladin starts its turn in the aura, it takes 4d10 psychic damage. Meaning you get into the you you like get into a place or whatever. Uh you probably want to pop off your channel divinity, like dreadful aspect first, and then next turn pop off the dread lord, which then basically means like any person any any uh enemy that is frightened that starts its turn in the aura will just automatically take the 40 10 psychic damage additionally the paladin and creatures he or she chooses in the aura are draped in deeper shadow creatures that rely on sight have disadvantage on attack rolls against the creatures draped in this shadow also when the paladin says that there is no limit to how many creatures can be draped in shadow here it just says the paladin and creatures he or she chooses in the aura are draped in shadow. Mm -hmm. So that can be any number. Meaning if you have your own undead horde. They have to be within the aura, but. Which is, thir it's a 30 foot radius. That's a 60 foot diameter. So it's like you have, again, you have your own undead horde or even like a, a, a horde of fiends. You can just drape them all in that. And they have disadvantage on, on, on uh, attack rolls against all of them. While the aura lasts, the paladin can use a bonus action or his return to cause the shadows in the aura to attack one creature. The paladin makes a, a melee spell attack against the target, and if the attack hits, the target takes necrotic damage equal to 3d10 plus the paladin's charisma modifier. After activating the aura, the paladin can't do so again until he or she finishes a long rest. So, I mean, that, that ain't a bad 20th level capstone ability by all standards of measurement. Like... That's not terrible. Again, I will always stand by like most of the Paladin, like the Paladin 20th level abilities, which again is still insane to me. What is it? Was it was it was it Watchers or Crown who doesn't have a 20th level ability? Crown. It wasn't they have no aura. Yeah, that too. Like, okay, no, yeah. Crown, so Crown just doesn't have an aura. What what is a 20th level crown ability? Um uh, hang on. Okay, they have exalted, exalted champion. champion. Yeah. Okay. So they all they still have a really bad one though. <laughs> yeah. They have a really bad one. Uh, but still, either way, um, point being, uh, the Oathbreaker is decent, only really though as a a BBEG or yeah. if you're doing an evil campaign. Uh, that's that's again why this particular subclass even though it's technically an OG subclass, it was one of the first, even in the, in the, the uh, player's handbook, it like, it, it wasn't listed as an actual like player subclass. Initially, it was listed in the back of like the player's handbook as like a, an evil BBEG, like uh mirror to a paladin for like DMs to utilize against players because of the reasons like here, the aura of hate you're going to be fighting evil creatures. A lot of them are going to be undead. A lot of them are going to be fiends. And they're going to benefit from this where your, uh, your allies, like the, the paladin's friends, will not benefit from this aura feature at all. Just the paladin. And then arguably, again, your enemies will, which is a huge detriment. Huge detriment. Along with the fact, yeah, you know, it's like supernatural resistance. My other thing is why, like, I guess don't fight fiends and undead but but those are some of the coolest things to fight though well, and, yeah. and like and also the most one of the most prolific two enemy types to encounter because they're usually the easiest to be like yeah. hey we have a problem with how you do things because you do a lot of evil chaotic messed up stuff so we're fighting you like you are absolutely going to encounter tons and myriads of undead and feet whereas so having this subclass in that kind of campaign that you're fighting against them not good, not good at all. Very bad. Um, but it's still a cool subclass. Like again, use utilizing it where it shines as a BBEG or as an enemy combatant or in an evil campaign, you can do like I said, a lot of dope. You can literally control a number of undead to then make your own undead little army or legion, which you can then empower with your aura of hate. Like that's super cool. Supernatural resistance again. Not really great for a player character, but for a BBEG, like that the GM is controlling, 
the resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks, yeah, that that absolutely is applicable. Because a lot of uh, if say you know you have some uh some NPCs that are coming with you to fight, like on, on the good side, a lot of them probably aren't going to have like magic weapons. So this makes it like, oh, this this entity or this paladin is an actual real threat because he also he takes so much less damage from any of these normal mundane people. So that's why it's like up to you and your party to deal with that. Or as an evil character, you have less to worry about in terms of like more mundane evil. Like you can you can do a lot more like overtly evil stuff in like a city or whatever because guards and stuff mostly are not going to have magical weapons to deal with you. So you have even less uh, fear of them in regards to this. Uh, and yeah, so it's just like, it's a cool subclass and super flavorful. Like it is jam packed with amazing flavor and potential role play opportunities, but it is very clear. Uh, like Sam said himself, like it by design, by intentional design, this subclass is, is far and away deliberately meant for evil campaigns or as enemy combatants to a good aligned party or even a neutral aligned party um just for the things that it does and the abilities that it offers overall it is it is deliberately designed to be evil it is evil just evil um doesn't have to be of course but that is the design and so unless you do some specific homebrew stuff to limit the amount of detrimental things that will come up come about by choosing this subclass. Uh, usually better, just just keep it evil. Just keep it. You have so many other uh, pilot and subclasses to choose from. If you still want to be, you know, more good or neutral aligned, whatever, just just go with that, so that you don't have <laughs> literal mechanics working against you. Unless you just want to be on hard mode. Fair enough. Go go. You know, go ahead, knock yourself out. Go on hard mode and let all the enemies literally be stronger uh against you i would like but. to keep it evil please <laughs> yeah otherwise just uh just keep it evil you know we're, we're just keeping it straight evil but you know what uh any other ideas thoughts or things you have on this the oathbreaker excuse me subclass sammy no I, I personally i think you know you can always talk to a dm if you really want to play it um there might be a way to i mean how to i convince feel about them it. to be like hey actually can like it works this way so i can still play in a normal i mean i feel like the easiest fix is just be like the paladin can control who his aura affects is like that's that's kind of how i always feel about it that's how i usually play it like even with uh you know like in a good campaign with good with a quote-unquote good paladin i'm still like you 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 choose who your aura affects even among a group of so-called friendly you know individuals or friendly creatures or whatever, you know, like you, you can still choose who your aura affects. Um, because I feel like, again, who is considered friendly to you as a matter of your personal perspective or thought in the moment, you know, if a person who was friendly a second ago comes off as maybe being a little bit antagonistic or shitter or whatever, or trollish, you can be like, yeah, I don't really view you as being friendly right now. And so the aura would not necessarily affect them, you know? So, but with this one, obviously it's a little harder because it does specifically stipulate that it is any fiend or undead in the aura, whether they're friendly or not. So that it would take a little bit of deliberate conversation with your GM. Um, but obviously still easiest fix is just being like, you know what? You control who your aura affects at any given time. Um, yeah, so I say like with that, uh, that's about all we got for today for you, y'all. We hope that you guys have enjoyed the journey with us. Again, please be sure to like and comment the video. Tell us what you guys think of these subclasses. What are some ideas or ways that you could implement the Oathbreaker in, maybe in a good campaign and still be cool and interesting and not super detrimental? Uh, what do you guys think of the the Hunter, you know, the old Hunter uh, Ranger subclass, or even the Cronergy Wizard and the Mercy Monk, you know? Um, thank you guys again. Please be sure to, uh, to subscribe and share the channel. And we will be sure to catch you guys next time when we dive deep back down into the archive. So long, y'all. Take care.